Thank you all for being here and for joining us on Zoom. Uh, this is an exciting topic for us to cover today. Um, again, my name is Sanjay Ironman, one of the neurologists here. I'm, a, I'm the movement side of the memory movement, so I see most of the Parkinson's uh, patients. I do have a, a handful of folks that end up in my clinic that do have uh, memory or cognitive dysfunction, so I'm always trying to pay attention to so I know what I'm supposed to be doing as well, um, and I'm always glad to have the help of my colleagues. Um, you know, there have been a lot of uh, interesting uh, and significant advances uh, just in the last year or two uh, in our field. I mean, both on the memory and movement side. I mean, selfishly, the, the, the tools at my disposal to treat Parkinson's have really gotten exciting. There's a new uh, levodopa pump that's just like an insulin pump for our patients. That's really exciting. Um, there's a new skin biopsy that we've been doing for the last year or two that helps us diagnose it. Um, but there have been some monumental changes uh, on the memory side of the business, and that's what we're really here to talk about today. And, uh, you know, the approach to the patients, I mean, it used to be that uh, if someone showed up in our office and was having some issues with memory or cognition, you know, we would look for some reversible things, you know, are there vitamin deficiencies, are there other electrolyte abnormalities that we might be able to correct and, and then fix the problem, uh, you know, a, a brain scan and whether it's a CAT scan or an MRI goes a long way to show any major problems. If there's a big brain tumor, um, some people have too much uh, spinal fluid circulating and it can cause a lot of memory problems, so they drain it. Um, so we look for things that we can fix, but once we get past that and we don't find anything that can be acted upon, um, there really wasn't a big need to do a lot of digger, uh, you know, deeper diving uh, in terms of, you know, a workup and tests and other things to really delineate what is the exact problem. But things have really changed um, just in the last year or two, and that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, before we get too deep into this, uh, I'd like to start with Dr. Thomas. Um, just a little ice-breaking question. What is your favorite flavor of ice cream? <laughs> I have a few, but coffee, <laughs> coffee, I would say. Coffee, ice cream? Yeah. Okay, okay. I can, I can handle that. I've lately acquired a taste of what's ginger. Ginger, yeah. okay. That's very nice. Okay, very good. He's a, he's a sensitive palate. Um, so, so, Dr. Thomas, uh, you know, a question always comes up, you know, you know, I, I set my keys down all the time and forget where they are, or I have little things here, you know, how do, how do you tell the difference between normal aging uh, and, and dementia? A good question, Sanjay, and it's a very common question because we all start somewhere and we all age uh, in a good way, um, but there are some changes that you would see with aging, and uh, uh, when I say some changes, it's mainly towards the cognition I'm talking about, um, which might be perceived as an abnormal change, but there are really uh, some normal changing, changing in cognition that happens as we age. So things like anything to do with speed uh, of your memory, uh, like especially working memory, where you have two or three information in there and you are trying to figure out what to do with that information and the speed of which you do it, that might slow down as we age. Um, the other thing is your attention span goes down as we age. Um, the other thing is if... Uh, um, if you have to reason out some things, that also slows down uh, some, to, you know, as we age. And these are normal changes that happens uh, in, uh, uh, as we age. Uh, sometimes there are some changes which are good. Um, so things like um, your vocabulary, things like your general knowledge increases as we age um, certain, to a certain extent. Um, but, um, and at some point it might plateau. Now, all of this is because part of our brain kind of shrinks over time. Um, like um, they say about 0.5 to 1% per year, um, there's a little bit of shrinkage that happens every year. Um, but when it becomes pathological is when it starts to affect your ability to function on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's when we think about dementia, uh, where um, any of these changes come to a point where it's affecting your ability to work with your finances or ability to um, manage your medications or um, ability to drive. So any of that, when it happens, you think about dementia. Now, there's somewhere in the middle, there's this 
it's not really affecting you uh, with your daily activities, but at the same time, there's it's more than uh, what you would see with a normal aging, and we call it mild cognitive impairment. Now, the diseases that would cause dementia can also cause this mild cognitive impairment. Um, so um, it's very important that we understand um, uh, the difference between the normal aging process and uh, what happens with dementia. One question that sort of came up was, uh, you know, what's the difference between dementia and, and Alzheimer's disease? Or what, are, what do those words mean to you? So, good question. So, dementia is kind of an umbrella term. Um, it basically means that these cognitive changes are affecting your daily functioning. Now, Alzheimer's disease is kind of the commonest cause for um, dementia that we are aware of right now. Um, and it is, there, there are some agreements and disagreements to this, yeah. but, um, you know, the primary cause for this is amyloid plaques, but uh, there are some people who think otherwise. Um, but it, it is a condition where um, you start noticing um, uh, these proteins affecting the brain and shrinking the brain in certain areas of the brain to start with, and eventually affecting the whole of the brain. So that uh, what I would say is it is the commonest cause for dementia, but there are other causes like vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, uh, frontotemporal dementia. So there are, there are many other causes for dementia. Okay. Very good. Um, thank you. Um, Dr. Wu, um, if we were to step into your car and turn your playlist on, what song might be playing? <laughs> uh, probably my daughter would have, uh, we only have one Spotify account. We're a frugal family, so she would have Spotify, so it would be whatever is playing on the radio, because I can only use it when she's not using it. <laughs> so. Very, very <laughs> Um, you know, as we were as we were speaking about earlier, you know, we used to look for the the reversible causes. We checked the thyroid function, we checked the vitamin B12, uh, we you know, we get the the MRIs, and uh, everything comes back, and, and we don't really find vastly abnormal. Um, tell us how the diagnostic approach and algorithm has really changed in the last year or two, uh, and and what those sort of tests might include. Yeah, the landscape has changed so much for us and we're honestly we're still adjusting and trying to figure out what the right approach is and when to do tests and some of them are so new that we're uh you know we're we're using them but all, uh, people around the country real around the world really are trying to figure out how to use these things but the reason um, probably that things have changed a lot is because of the new therapies that are out and, you know, whether how well they work, who they might be right for, what the risks are, that those are really big questions that we're also all trying to learn about. But because of those, um, and along with it, really, when we learned, uh, you know, uh, we understood more about uh, what's happening in Alzheimer's in particular because it is the most common cause, as Dr. Thomas said, um, that we know of, of uh, dementia, uh, that, you know, since those therapies um, have come out and with the science along with it, we now have new diagnostic tests. And some of them have been available to a certain extent through research for a while, like there's something, there's a PET amyloid scan and whether how that, whether you believe amyloid is the cause or just a marker or definitive, um, it's it's how doctors have defined it around the world. Um, and so uh, that we've, you know, had around for, I think the first one verified, you know, good ones were 20 years, 20 years ago, first ones, and then but we, as physicians, we never had them available to us. They were pretty much research. Um, and uh, and there was no reason that we necessarily wanted to do them because we wouldn't have done anything different anyway in our management. 
Um, but with the new medicines, um, and again, along you know with the new medicines and developing the science for the new medicines, came along the science of developing diagnosis. And then about five or six or seven years ago, um, spinal fluid tests became more available. Uh, and again, they weren't necessarily widely used. You can imagine we probably all hesitate at getting a lumbar puncture. And you might, you know, you might ask your doctor, well, what will we do differently with this? And if your doctor said not much, then you might say, let's let's not do it. So we had it um, and we would we would do it because sometimes I think knowing is also important um, so that we can plan and understand. So we we had that tool um, and then much more recently, we've had more verifiable blood tests. Uh, and uh, so those have been in, people have been trying to look at blood tests for 20 years. There are articles, you know, looking at the amyloid or that type of thing in the blood. Um, and we finally have some good ones, you know, that are more verified. Probably this year, maybe in the last one or two years, there's been you know, some changes, but uh, this year is where I think <clears throat> a lot of groups um, around the country are using just a handful that seem very, very good. So that's really changed. And so then when someone comes in, sorry, this is very long winded, <laughs> but um, I think the question was, why, you know, what has changed with diagnostics? So then now that we potentially have therapies, and again, it's a big question if how well they work, it's probably very individual. It probably very much depends on the person and there are all, you know, there are a lot of different factors we look at, how early is their disease process, their apolipoprotein E4 status, whether they have other medical issues. Those are probably the three main things. There are other things that we look at too. Um, but now we feel more compelled and to de to maybe define the process early, and that's that's a really big change for us mm -hmm. um, to be able to do that and to try to decide whether to do that too, because um, I think it can be scary for for frankly for you know or it's an unknown for for yeah. us too. We weren't we weren't able to do that so well before. Yeah. Well, thank you, um, Dr. Traconis. If if you could be any animal, <clears throat> what would it be and why? <laughs> oh, first of all, rum raisin is my favorite ice cream. <laughs> Sergio Mendez and the Brazil 66. I love that music. And a golden retriever because they're angels on earth. They're the best dog. All right. That's the only dogs my wife will let us have. Until recently, we rescued some a different type. Perfect he thinks answer. he's a golden. No, um, <laughs> Dr. Wu has told us uh, about the, the blood test looking for the amyloid and the APOE. Um, alleles. Uh, there's a, there's a spinal tap for the spinal fluid. Um, also, the the PET scan, the amyloid PET scan. You know, you've been very interested in a, in a test that's called cognition. Um, just with your neurophysiology yeah. background, I was wondering if you might be able to educate us a little bit about what that is. Yes, um, cognition is a pr proprietary name for a particular type of brain wave recording in uh, human beings. So, we were an early adopter of this type of test about six years ago. And I'm old enough to remember that the type of brain waves that we can now record in the office, we could have never done. It had to be in a sort of a complicated neurophysiology laboratory because these are essentially recordings of a person's um, thought waves. Uh, many of us have heard about electroencephalogram where you can just record all the electro electrical activity of the brain. And it's real noisy. I mean, we're all constantly producing these electrical currents. But these particular brain waves that we record requires us to sort of silence the brain. We cancel out all this brain activity like or digitally. And we're able to record these minute little impulses <laughs> that occur when we're doing a thinking task. And the different brain waves that we're able to record come from different parts of the brain and they correlate to brain function like memory, language, attention, concentration. So we're literally recording thought waves, although we can't tell what people are thinking happily. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> yes. <laughs> we, um, 
and what we've learned is that there are different conditions in the brain that can slow or impede these thought waves. So we actually record how fast the currents are going through the brain, like electrical wires, and how robust the current impulse is. We call it the amplitude. And um, over the years, um, scientists have worked out what happens to these brain waves with different conditions, including Alzheimer's disease. So um, Dr. Wu was talking about um, tests that are markers for Alzheimer's, like um, serum biomarkers or spinal fluid biomarkers. This test called cognition is essentially a, a neurophysiological biomarker. And when we took on the task of doing this test, we were uncertain how accurate it would be. So we, we put it to our test. And we found out that early on, there are brainwave changes that can warn us that Alzheimer's is coming or that Alzheimer's is here. So that brainwave test has been fairly accurate in predicting who's at risk of getting Alzheimer's. It's not adequate enough to say they have it, um, and it's not, certainly not adequate enough to decide on treatments but it's another one of our tests that helps give us confidence in the diagnosis. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, growing up, my, uh, my best friend's dad was an orthopedic surgeon, and when I decided to go to medical school, he was always trying to recruit me, come to the OR and come see what I'm doing, and then when I ultimately told him I think I was going to become a neurologist, he was, he was very disappointed. He said, all they do is diagnose and adios. <laughs> there are no treatments, and that's kind of the, the lay of the land, you know, 20, 25 years ago, uh, you know, in, in, in this area, especially in memory care. Um, but a lot has changed as these new treatments have come out, and there actually are two FDA-approved treatments for Alzheimer's, so it does behoove us to, to do the workups on the right people. But Dr. Chakotis, I wanted to ask you, in terms of the treatment advances, you know, what is lecanemab, and what is donanemab, and what's the difference, really? Yes, yeah. I think Dr. Wu uh, pointed to our relative uncertainties about the place for these new drugs. It's also new in many ways, but uh, you know, just to back up a little bit, uh, types of treatments uh, for Alzheimer's disease have included um, symptomatic treatment, where uh, you give a medicine that improves symptoms, but it's not impacting the course of the illness. And many of us have heard about like Aricep, it kind of boosts the acetylcholine in the brain, helps normal or unaffected parts of the brain function better, and maybe that will help people compensate for the consequences of Alzheimer's. But it doesn't really make the disease better or change it in any way. But with these new medicines, these are what we call disease-modifying therapies where they don't improve symptoms, sadly. I mean, these medicines, if you give it to someone with Alzheimer's, uh, they're not going to perform better in their daily lives. Um, that was a, a relative disappointment, um, but it can slow down progression. So truly modify the disease by changing something in the brain that's abnormal, namely the accumulation in the cortex of the brain of an abnormal form of a normal protein called amyloid. So it's called amyloid beta 42, where 40 is okay, but 42 is not. So um, way back in the early 1900s, when Dr. Alzheimer's had a young patient with behavioral abnormalities, turned out she had what subsequently was named after him, Alzheimer's disease, the first case of Alzheimer's. And back then, he when she, when she passed away, um, they examined her brain and they found uh, these aggregations of abnormal protein that subsequently was identified as amyloid. So amyloid since then has been the prevailing uh, distraction for us. I mean, there's so many different things in the brain uh, that change with Alzheimer's that are being looked at as potential therapeutic targets, but Alzheimer's consumed all the interest and a lot of the research dollars for years, for the past 25 years, really, but things are really shifting to look to other treatments that might be used in addition to these new medicines that can rinse the brain almost literally of, of amyloid. So these new two new drugs that uh, Dr. Iyer referenced, uh, lecanemab, also called Lequembi, or denanemab, also called Kisunla, and I'm very proud that I could pronounce all of them. <laughs> <laughs>
the, um, they both do a good job of assisting the immune system and taking out amyloid that accumulates in the brain. They're injectable medicines. Um, there will be a subcutaneous form of Lequembi at some point soon, which will make it much easier to give because right now you have to infuse the medicines in an infusion center. Um, but these medications are antibodies that are human antibodies made outside of humans, and then you give them to people. They go in and seek out amyloid, bind to the amyloid, and then the immune system in our brain called oligodendrocytes attached to that antibody and just take the whole thing out. So within about a year, about 75% of people have the amyloid removed. Um, it sounds wonderful. Um, we we were hopeful it would do more. I mean, the, the holy grail is a medicine that would prevent us from getting Alzheimer's in the first place. But if you have it, the next best thing would be to reverse it with a medicine. The next best thing would be to stabilize it. But what we have with these new medicines is slowing the worsening. So we're starting with the least of the best results and hopefully working backwards. Um, these medications um, have limited utility based on appropriate use, meaning we have to find people who are at least, at least risk of side effects because we're all worried about the side effects from these drugs because they can cause bleeding and swelling in the brain, essentially strokes. Um, these are immune drugs. They're inflaming the brain in an effort to take out amyloid. So it's a bit of an immune firestorm, and you can cause um, injury to the blood vessels as a result, and they can leak and bleed. Uh, while the majority of people don't even know they're having any of that, so it's of innocent consequence, and we don't really see it on a brain scan, some people get strokes from it, and some people have died from that. But ultimately, um, the medicines are reasonably equivalent in terms of the potential benefit of slowing down the course of the illness. There's some differences in the risks. Maybe Kassun uh, lies a little bit higher risk of some of these adverse changes in the brain. They've been called ARIA, not the, we were talking about this, uh, ARIA, when I grew up, that was like a solo in opera, mm -hmm. right? But ARIA is a um, sort of an industry term for amyloid-related imaging abnormalities, meaning bleeding and swelling in the brain that happen as a result of these medicines taking out the amyloid. So all that has to be taken seriously. And we've been in committee several times talking about how do we select the right person who's at the least risk to gain the best benefit from the medicines. And a lot of that is still in debate, um, but we do have new treatments that can modify the course of the illness. Thank you. Um, yeah, we talked about the risks of, of treatment. I mean, the big ones that I always see are swelling in the brain, bleeding in the brain. Are there other uh, risks, major risks that we need to be worried about besides those? Those are the major the, ones. Yeah. And okay. they can so, be, that's bad. That's, that's <laughs> plenty. That's plenty. <laughs> that's plenty. That's plenty. People so, can get a little bit more headache, probably with that immune response in, you know, in the brain. That's they so it's a it, it's a slight increase compared to placebo. That's not usually a big deal. No. But you know, those two side effects are quite significant. <laughs> Enough to keep us up at night. Yes. Um, yes. And Jay, infusion reaction can be another big fact. Infusion reactions. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So um, the, let's kind of shift gears a little bit. Um, you know, Dr. Jaconis kind of touched a little bit on sort of patient selection. You know, how do we how do we know who should get this, who should not get this? You know, you know, I always think whenever a new treatment comes out, we all you know that you know we always look around and say, okay, this this person has tried and failed everything else. Why not? Let's <laughs> let's give them this new one and see what happens. Um, you know, is that a good idea? Um, you know, families will come in and say, you know, we'll do anything that we, we possibly can to help uh, his or her memory. Can we please just try it? Um, you know, those are some of the things that, that give us a little bit of pause knowing what these big side effects are. But um, and maybe we can just sort of as a panel kind of answer this question. But to, I mean, tell me, are there major exclusions? Are there who are the people that you absolutely would not treat? Or is it based on? Um, a cognitive score, an MRI finding, uh, other comorbidities. Who are the people who we should not treat? You want to go down the line? I'll start. <clears throat> well, we know that the indication for these drugs, <clears throat> excuse me, is uh, someone who has 
mild cognitive impairment or mild dementia from Alzheimer's. The term is early Alzheimer's, but it's not early onset. It just means a really mild form of Alzheimer's. It looks like these medications shouldn't be given too far into the course of the condition because declining benefit. And if you have the risk of bleeding, you want plenty of benefit to outweigh the risk as much as, much as possible. So that's one way to select someone based on <clears throat> the level or, or, or severity of the dementia from Alzheimer's. And you can use different measures of that, including a, a simple score called the mini mental state exam uh, test. And I know there's a lot of other things too. Uh, folks can share. So another thing <clears throat> is um, if you have um, conditions like major depression um, or um, uh, mood disorders that are not well controlled, um, that's another exclusion uh, criteria. And I think um, also if you don't have someone else to be a partner with you to try to get to these appointments and keep maintain that uh, treatment plan, that's another kind of uh, exclusion criteria for um, uh, these treatments. Uh, also, if you already have um, bleeding um, in the brain, then you run at a higher risk for uh, areas. So um, there are some uh, cutoffs that they have for micro bleeds, small bleeds. Um, and, and those are the main things that come to mind. Yeah, and I think uh, the imaging, I think one of the qualifying uh, measures for both studies was not having a lot of vascular changes aside from the bleeding there you know they they number the number of micro hemorrhages or this other entity called superficial siderosis and so it's those signs um, and then but if you have a lot of vascular changes that was automatically excluded uh, probably because then it's likely that you have two things going on and it's less likely that the medicine will help you and also that you're more likely with all those vascular changes to have the side effects. And then going along with the bleeding, um, being on anticoagulation is, it wasn't listed as an absolute, but I think most physicians are taking that as essentially an absolute contraindication, especially with the open extension trial part of the lecanemab were the three, you know, the the three patients who passed me in that open label, they all had, uh, they were all on anticoagulants. So I think people in general, and then there's a, yeah, there's a variety of other things to take into account, healthier, <laughs> you know, fewer medical problems, um, hypertension, you know, all, a lot of other things, mm -hmm. but those are probably the, the main ones, mild, no bleeding in the brain, no major vascular changes in the brain and not on anticoagulation. Are there certain uh, certain tests or certain factors that might uh, predict someone's risk of bleeding um, from the treatment? Yeah, we, I think we've been living in this world of APOE4, you may have heard of this. We, we all have a, a gene called APO lipoprotein E or APOE. Um, and there's two copies of that gene with we are called alleles. And the choices, the numbered choices of all of us are two, three, and four. So any combination, two and three, two and four. Um, and we know that the majority of people have a three uh, or copies of three in, in the world. And that neither confers any protection or risk of getting Alzheimer's. But the number four gene is the one that increases our risk. It's not necessarily our destiny that we'll get Alzheimer's if we have one or two copies of four, but the risk climbs the more copies you have. So that's, it's an interesting gene from the risk perspective, um, <clears throat> but plenty of people don't have fours who get Alzheimer's. So it's not a real practical test for Alzheimer's or the risk of getting it. But it was tested in these clinical studies for the Alzheimer's amyloid drugs to see if people with one or two copies of four did better or worse on the drug in some way? Was it, did it work less well in them? 
where there are more complications or side effects from it. And lo and behold, um, having one copy of number four raises the risk a little bit higher of bleeding or swelling compared to people who have no fours. But if you have two fours, it goes really high, much higher. And some individuals, some treatment centers, some payers don't like to see two fours and neither do we. So um, we haven't really talked as a team much about our particular opinions about it, but I, I worry more about the side effects if someone has two copies of four. So we likely would not treat that individual that it's my opinion that I would not. I'm not sure how you all feel about that. I mean, you know, I realize that we counsel families and patients about the risks and benefits and then sit back, but we're drawn back in because it's hard for people to not want to hear our opinion. And I try very hard to make everyone an expert and let them decide, but I realize that it's hard to not offer opinion. I worry considerably about two copies of four. You know, we, we kind of touched on a little bit. Now, who is the ideal candidate? It sounds like early, um, not very impaired, um, not a lot of other medical comorbidities. I've heard diabetes thrown around a little bit with, uh, with these treatments. I mean, if someone is diabetic, does that raise the risk of complications from infusion? Um, maybe meaning the, the, the bleeding, the swelling, those kinds of things. I mean, obviously, you know, healing and infusion reactions might be different, but... Does being diabetic necessarily raise the risk? I'm not aware of that. Are you all? No. Yeah, I don't know that that was borne out in the studies. Okay. I know high blood pressure for yeah. denanumab um, raised the risk. Okay. Um, yeah. And then the APOE4 double is difficult. I mean, if you have, you know, I, I know different centers, some centers are not infusing at all, um, and, and some payers, and some very well-established, well-regarded centers are, mm -hmm. uh, and it may be selection where, you know, no comorbidities, very mild, an enthusiastic patient who's risk, who's risk, very risk tolerant, mm -hmm. um, you know, because uh, I think a lot of it is up to, it's very hard. I wish, uh, you know, it's not like coming in and giving a medicine uh, that, you know needs to be given an infection that needs to be cleared and your cultures and sensitivities tell you to use vancomycin you know um this is more it's so individual do you want to take on that risk that burden um it keeps you up at night <laughs> are there any absolute sort of age cutoffs um in the trials i think denanumab was 85 and lecanemab was 90. they okay. actually did it <laughs> If it, I yeah. mean, I think they wanted to yeah. see, and there are people who maybe were enthusiastic, and yeah. So, but it's interesting because I mean, I mean, most clinical trials typically are you know age eighteen to eighty uh, for the vast majority. So the fact that they extended that is very interesting because you know some of the questions were you know I'm eighty eight years old, would I qualify? Mm -hmm. So there is no absolute cutoff. It's really the clinical situation and how they are. Well, um, Dr. Thomas, we've talked a, a little bit about who the ideal candidate may be. Um, tell me, how, how would you counsel the ideal candidate as to what they might expect? Um, you know, is it going to cure the problem? Is it going to take them back 30 years? Is it going to marginally improve something? Like, how would you how would you go about counseling the, the ideal patient for what to expect? I, I usually start with what matters most for that patient. You know, um, we can say whatever we want or provide whatever we want. If, if the patient doesn't want to go through this, it doesn't make sense for them. So I stop there. And uh, and then I would also um, communicate with them, you know, that this is not a cure. Um, you know, we at best can slow the progression of the disease. And that too, you have to go through a lot of things. You know, it's not like, uh, a one week of treatment. This is going to be a longer treatment over several months. And how logistically they can, or, you know, go for this, you know, is this, is this practical for me to do, to do these treatments? Am I going to have these MRIs in between um, uh, to make sure that uh, there's no complications? If I have a complication, do I understand what I need to do? 
So all of that will come into play when you go through this treatment. So it is not an easy process. And uh, however, this is a step forward. And so we have hope in a way that uh, we never had before. Um, so um, it, I, I would put it in a way that, yes, we, we have risks that we need to address. We have a, a long journey. Uh, but there is hope through this. But I always like to come back to what their uh, wishes are, what what matters most for them. What are they trying to accomplish? That is right. Okay. Um, you know, as, as you talk through uh, the logistics, um, I mean, if someone goes on treatment, and I think, Dr. Wee, you have a couple of patients right now, maybe on Lakembi uh, therapy, what is the typical cadence for, I mean, what does their infusion look like? Is it daily? Is it weekly, monthly? How many scans do they have to have? Are you kind of curious what that cadence looks like? Yeah, so it's, it's time intensive. It is an IV medication that you have to go to an infusion center every other week four. And currently, there is not an end in sight. It's ongoing. That being said, uh, they are, as Dr. Chaconis mentioned, um, they are in the, in the research phase. Um, they have trialed, uh, they've given patients a uh, subcutaneous form. So, and they've already submitted to the FDA for <coughs> approval. We expect that since the medication itself is the same, it's just the delivery method. So that might ease that ongoing infusion burden. Um, uh, you do have to do periodic MRIs. Um, you know, there there's slightly different cadence between the two, but about three or four well, besides the baseline in the next 12 to 18 months is, is you know, usually what's seen, and then we don't know after 18 months. Um, the the side effects do tend to be earlier in the course, but not always. Um, so uh, I am somewhat risk averse, so I tend to get MRIs more quickly if someone calls with any potential side effect. It's also early in the course. So, you know, I've done earlier than the cadence suggested. Um, and uh, there are trials now. They're looking at what you know. What should the cadence be for lecanemab afterwards? I know with zinanimab, they stopped for seventy-five percent of patients cleared at eighteen months, so they stopped it. We don't have the data after that part of the trial is stopped for the open label extension for lecanemab. We have some of that. Um, and so those are, right now though, what you're looking at committing to is every other week, IV infusions at an infusion center. So it's-, it's Does it last the whole week or is it a one day, one day during that week? One day during that week. So, you know, probably the actual infusion is maybe a little over an hour, but the whole process is probably a couple of hours, you know, okay. arriving. I think that it's expensive. Medicare covers it so far. <laughs> and so, um, they, they, I, you know, the center that I've had patients go to, they have to arrive before they actually get it from the pharmacy because then it's, it's hung. They want it. They, you know, they're only taking that thousand dollar medicine out when the person is is ready. Sure. So that that adds to the time a little bit. Okay. Well, um, should we shift over to the questions that were yeah. sent in? Um, uh, we've been receiving quite a few in the chat box as well. Well, I'm just looking through the ones that were already submitted. Um, one, you know, obviously, mm -hmm. or, or does this overlap at all with, you know, with vascular dementia, or frontotemporal dementia? Again, these uh, donanumab and, uh, and lecanumab are approved only for Alzheimer's disease. So just to answer that question, um, has donanumab gotten approval um, through Medicare yet? That's a good question. Just got it. I mean, FDA approved in July. FDA approved, I, I think Medicare has. So that they'll cover it. They should, I think they'll cover it. Um, there was a question uh, related to uh, the HOPE study. Um, this is the, the use of sensory stimulation. And I'm happy to comment on it just a little bit. There's, this, is a, this is a study 
um, looking at patients with Alzheimer's disease and they're actually wearing, uh, it's a set of almost like goggles that have headphones as well. And it introduces some uh, audio and visual stimuli to, to the patients. And uh, there were, I think, 400 patients that went into this uh, observational study. I think half of them got the real stimulation, half of them got sort of a sham stimulation. Um, what they're reporting is that, you know, there, were, there was improvement in their memory scores when we test them with the, the office test, the MMSE. Um, they actually looked at some brain volume information, you know, quantifying brain volume. And they, what they showed was that in the patients who received the real stimulation, there was a um, there was a slowing of the shrinkage of the brain compared to the people who got the sham stimulation. Again, this is a very small study. It was um, um, mostly observational. I think there's a lot more to be done here. But what's nice is it's a non-pharmacologic treatment that potentially could have some impact and. Um, I actually have a few patients I've referred to it. Um, you know, they were outside the range of where I would you know, ever want to consider these IV treatments for various reasons, but here's something that, you know, was less invasive and might actually be helpful. So uh, obviously more to come on this, but that was just one of the questions that, that came in. Um, and then sit there yes. on the chat box. There are several ones. Mm -hmm. Um when will Consula be available in infusion centers for patients? Probably not. It, it's approved. We think it's, <laughs> we keep waiting. Yeah. Very soon, we think. But. Yeah, but my take on this, <clears throat> I mean, there are a lot of infusion centers that are already giving medicines for other conditions, rheumatological conditions, oncology, treatment for cancers. But, but the, we're gearing up to be able to give these drugs. They're new. There's other things they have to be concerned about to watch for. So I think the whole country has been a little slow in the infrastructure to give this. Um, but um, Charlotte is getting there. We were kind of surprised because we're not small potatoes. Why do you have to go to Duke or Wake or something? <laughs> we're all disciples from these universities that you know, we trained in. But, so Charlotte will get on the map soon where it should be all up and running. And Atrium is infusing lecanemab. And they are, they've said that they, when denanemab is available, they, have, they will have that available as well. Okay. Um, this is an easy one. I could even answer this one. <laughs> will some patients participating in GUIDE receive placebo versus others who receive actual medications? GUIDE is actually not a drug study. Um, it's an approach to care study. So. Um, I can see why the confusion would come because of the timing. Um, is Lecambi research ongoing? And if so, what is being studied? Is anyone looking at long-term administration of Lecambi? Yeah, so they, they have that open label extension. And then, you know, with the patients who receive the medicine, the placebo group was offered to, if they still qualify, jump on board. And then they are... They've been looking at what the right cadence for post-infusion is. I think actually they're looking at, well, both the sub-Q, but monthly. Um, and then I think also that there's probably more. Uh, I know that they're looking at one in combination with an anti-tau therapy that you could also get placebo, which would be neither. I asked if it would be lecanemab in both but it would be lecanemab plus a tau. So definitely, definitely they're still looking because it's not the answer. It's not the only, it's not gonna cure it. That's that's why they're still looking. We wish it was a cure. Um, what is the difference between lecambi and Kinsula and how is it decided which one is best for the patient? <clears throat> we may all have varying opinions, sometimes I, my opinion changes. I mean, these when you design a clinical trial, <clears throat> you have certain measures of performance. Maybe it's a cognitive performance or daily functional performance with Alzheimer's disease, like how well am I taking care of myself? How independent am I staying? Um, and how well am I performing on tests for memory, for example? And there are various measures for that. Um, and if a clinical study for one drug is identical to a clinical study for the other. You could make an effort to compare them. It's best to do head-to-head -head studies where you have two medicines in the same trial. 
Um, it, the next best would be their design similarly and use the same measures. And with um, the Viagen drug, Laquembi versus the release drug, um, Kisunla, they, <clears throat> the primary, the most robust measures were different. They didn't use the same tests. The secondary measure of denanumab or Kisunla was similar to the primary measure of Laquembi. So it's really hard to do a head-to-head -head comparison. We're tempted to do so, but and we all have looked at it. I think my this may be a sort of default. I they do the same thing and they do the same thing well. They take out amyloid. There's been some argument that if if your drug takes out not only the big blob of amyloid, but all the little pieces that aggregate together the precursors, we call them monomers, oligomers, fibrillary forms. These little pieces are damaging to the brain as well as the big one. So if you can go back further in the production of amyloid and take out the little damaging ones as well, maybe it works better. That may be the explanation why a lot of other anti-amyloid drugs failed in clinical trials before these approved ones. Um, and then, you know, we're always looking at the adverse out, adverse uh, side effects and how do they compare. Um, there's a bit more uh, rate of adverse side effects with Kisunla compared to the other. You know, there is another drug called Aduhelm or Aducanumab that have to take a pause because they have to come back and show the FDA a confirmatory study that matches one of the other confirmatory studies. It was preliminarily approved because it takes out amyloid, but there was a lot of controversy about that. But they're coming back, and I suspect that's going to get approved. But how do you pick these drugs? It's tough for me. I think it was really, Laquendi was the only really available one. That was the easy one. That's all we could pick, but now we have two. And how do you choose between the two? I'm still not certain. I don't know if you all have an opinion about that. Yeah, I'm not certain which one to choose uh, in um, convenience of every four weeks versus every two weeks with what it can be. Um, the other thing is infusion reaction might be slightly more with uh, what can be as opposed to um, um, the kiss in the lab. Um, so it's, it's very hard. Um, can we switch uh, from one to the other? You're right. um, and so there are a lot of questions that we are actually learning um, still. One question that's up there is uh, if, if changes in heart rate uh, can be a side effect of Lakembi, um, what does that mean for a patient with AFib or uh, heart valve problems? I think from an internal medicine standpoint, maybe Dr. Thomas might be able to educate us a little bit. Um, not very sure about that. Um, I'll have to pass on that. Yeah, I can't. Are, are you aware? I, I imagine vital signs could change while you're getting the infusion. infusion, infusion. Right. You're sitting in a lounge chair and you're feeling woozy and your blood pressure change and heart rate change and dizzy, nausea. Those things are fairly common and manageable, but I don't think otherwise it's changing the regulation of the heartbeat or jeopardizing the heart rate and atrial fibrillation. I don't think there was much evidence of that. I agree. I think sometimes with any kind of infusion, it seems that you know the faster you try to infuse it, the more problems people have. And sometimes that infusion centers are running behind, and you want to make sure you're not you're not getting the fast infusion. So that might be part of it. Um, are there other questions that are up there? Um, I can't. I think that is scroll down. The, no, that's the end of the chat box. How about uh, how about in the room for uh, our live audience? Curious about the impact that these uh, investigative boards have on the selection of the drugs, the approval of the, of the drugs, and uh, is is that something you're comfortable with? Because those boards, from what I understand, there's a lot of input from the industry, and that it bothers me. Uh, yeah, that's. Boy, that's a great question. <laughs> Do you want to repeat the question for the recording? Yeah, essentially, I mean, well, very good question. The, the notion of how much can we be competent in and secure with 
decisions around drug approval uh, or the um, the design of drug trials with these IRBs, uh, these review boards, uh, in an effort to make sure that the, the data is accurate, the safety is accurate, and we can all be confident that everything's good. We're on solid ground with these medications. And that starts with choosing people to get into clinical trials and how safe are they and how much do they know about the risks they're taking. Because ultimately, we know the incentive of these medicines, and with Alzheimer's being so prevalent across the world, finding a breakthrough drug would no doubt lead to riches for pharmaceutical companies and investors. <laughs> it would be a great financial burden across the world for taxpayers uh, because of the, uh, the cost of these drugs. Um, but, you know, there are standard operating procedures of research in human beings that pharmaceutical companies are supposed to religiously adhere to and regulatory agencies monitor so people don't drift in their bias and do things that might not be kosher in, in studying drugs in human beings. And many people, many times people don't even know they're biased. So we're trying to eliminate bias to get accurate information about the drugs and not put anybody at risk. Um, so you're right to raise the question, and we battle with that all the time. And you may have seen that doctors have increasingly distanced themselves from industry or pharmaceutical companies so that you all do not perceive we have bias towards particular drugs. Um, and most of the time, when we give talks, we're supposed to reveal any relationships with pharmaceutical companies, no matter how small so that everyone knows whether or not we may have potential biases. So we're on the lookout for these things. It's an excellent question. Um, and that's why we're, uh, we're laboring hard to know these drugs as best as we can. Um, the the Kassinla uh, drug, uh, the study estimates a slowing of progression by 35%. Uh, which equates to about six month delay in symptom worsening. Um, I don't know what that means. Uh, does that, you know, it, you get a reprieve of six months after doing all the infusions and all that, and that's it? Or I, I don't, I don't understand what that statement means. And I'm with you. I'm totally, I'm totally with you. <clears throat> And, and I'm sorry, I'm kind of monopolizing this, but I'll just be brief about this. Uh, I tried to get my hands wrapped around the definable, recognizable benefit of these drugs so that I could help our families and patients understand that. I mean, it's one thing to say, oh, on the tests, uh, compared to people on the medicine versus off, the people on the medicine seem to be earlier, milder, uh, maybe six months turning the hands of time back compared to people who weren't. So they were progressing faster and their level of dementia, no matter how you measure it, seemed to be six months further along. That may be a reasonable way to wrap your hands around the potential benefit of that. And people say, isn't that a very short advantage uh, relative to the risks and costs of these drugs? And that's an argument that really can be made and, and the, we were just talking earlier about the United Kingdom has decided not to cover these drugs because of the risk benefits and costs. And part of it was the limited efficacy. Um, but I'll, I'll say one more thing. What I struggle with is in clinical studies, you're comparing a drug to a placebo and a statistical difference. Mm -hmm. But what really is what we ought to be looking at is the clinically meaningful difference. If something's a little better than placebo statistically, can you recognize that as being meaningful? If you can't, then no one's going to notice it. And I'll give you a prime example. Aricept or Dinepazil, one of the oldest drugs out there for Alzheimer's, statistically is better than placebo in many ways, but most of our families and patients say, well, we're taking the drug, the doctor prescribed it, we don't see any benefit in it. That often is the case. There may be one exception that I won't get into, um, that you might be better off being on the drug long-term than if you weren't. Um, 
but it's a good point. Um, so I don't know how you all counsel families and patients on what to expect in terms of the benefit, but it's yeah, it's it's difficult. hard to. I th I think the hope. You, so for the six months, you have to remember that was over eighteen months. So then that looks better. You know, you're not saying lifetime six months, um, and we don't have the follow up data for denanumab. For lecanemab, we now have. I think three-year extension and the very mild group it seemed like a lot of the and we can't test for this they have pet tau the the no the low tau group there were there were some people who had no progression so you know these are you're you're waiting in hope and you're relying on two and a half year old data <laughs> and we have to make decisions it, and we'll know more in 10 years we'll I'll give great advice. So, <laughs> um, and I and I liken it a little bit to, you know, I, I came of age when we had all the new MS drugs and you have to, you, it, there's some risk. You don't know what the benefits will be. And, and some, you know, some of, some of them are riskier than others. And you don't know some of the downsides until they're more widely used. And so anyway, so it's, it's really hard. So six months, over 18 months, and that's when the trial ended, and that's all the information we have. Could you bring up a good point? The longer we follow the patients, uh, the more we may see relative to what happens not being treated. There may be an increasing separation where people are declining slower, but people are declining faster, never got the drug, and the difference between the two may be getting wider or more significant. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure about Are that. there longitudinal and, studies being done? To yeah, these are the, the, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So if you get it, uh, the people who are receiving it will be in a CMS registry. There's other registries. Uh, and then, yeah, and then like Hanna, at least they have that open label extension where they publish somewhere. It does seem like that line between placebo and the people who received it has grown. So, uh, but we don't, we don't have great information. It's, it's very new. It's very new. There's a couple new questions on the on the board there. Will you share more information on the new form of lecanemi? Uh, we don't know. It's a subcutaneous form, and uh, so self injection, and that's that's pretty much all. I, I think they yeah. they thought they said the side effects might even be less because it's. Direct IV, you get a, you know, to your body, whereas it's a slow infusion through um, when you self inject just because of the, has to have diffuse through that. Um, do you think that's a year away, two years away, maybe, or do we even know they do file it with the FDA? I don't know. They asked for approval sometime in the spring, late okay. spring so or summer. They're in the queue then. Okay. I don't know. <clears throat> they may say no. I don't know. Um, the other question that's up there is, are signs of brain bleed also associated with amyloid? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, the reason we do the baseline MRI <clears throat> before giving the medicine is uh, folks with Alzheimer's disease can bleed anyway. I mean, there's a high percentage of our patients have that condition, cerebral amyloid angiopathy. Cerebral meaning brain, amyloid meaning that protein, angiopathy meaning illness of the blood vessels. So it's in the blood vessels. So you can leak blood and have little dots of blood anyway, um, or other types of bleeding as a result. And you know the inflammation of the blood vessels from the drug and the extraction of amyloid is what makes the bleeding happen. And those ARIA changes were seen in, to a much lesser degree, but in placebo patients. So there's probably some of that, you know, the body is trying to clear on its, the, own. Yeah. It's on its own. So you, we saw it in people who didn't even receive the medicine. It's not the severe, you know, form of it, but yeah. the mild form of it. Any other questions? All the research seems to be focused toward amyloid. Is there any other avenue that's being explored, or do you all feel like there's something yeah. else that yeah. may? That's exciting. You mentioned tau. Yeah, yeah tau, and people are looking. Uh, I went to the Alzheimer's conference this summer, and I wanted to hear all about everybody's side effects <laughs> from lecanemab because I'm so scared. Uh, but 
uh, what I they they were over that. I mean, we I, they had those sessions, but they talked all about inflammation and glucose metabolism, and they're you know they think that this certainly is a piece of it, but uh, inflammation was the the big you know uh, thing that they're looking at. Where in that pathway? Where where have things gone wrong? But they're also trying to get at well, is it uh, you know, where, where, where is the dysfunction? Where does it really start? You know, amyloid is somewhere down the line. Can we get even earlier? So um, people are looking at lots of different things. So very, very basic science. Um, and then you probably you might see in the news like, oh, Ozempic helps everything. It seems like <laughs> <laughs> that. Uh, uh, and uh, I went to a session. I'll we'll we'll probably talk about it at some point on. Because they they looked at this on um, you know shingles vaccine is that helpful or you know all it, because anyway there's just there are, so lots of things inflammation um, uh, is 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 the big thing people are are looking at but they're looking at lots of different trials lots of different trials we're so much further along and there's something uh, <clears throat> I don't know where the vaccine is for um, amyloid and for tau tau is T A U the Greek letter tau that's Inside the nerve, abnormal tau, where it has a lot of phosphorus on it, um, leads to the destruction of the nerve. And if you can repair that or prevent that hyperphosphorylation, you may salvage the nerve and you could maybe stop Alzheimer's potentially, not sure. But, you know, um, so, so treatments that can either repair or prevent the destruction of tau or in, in process. But, um, 20 years ago, you may remember the Alzheimer's vaccine that they stopped because it essentially what you're doing is you're priming the person's immune system to have active immunity against that abnormal amyloid. So it's going to look everywhere in the body and seek it out, just like the injectable they were giving to find it. But your own immune system is laying in waiting. And maybe I'm going to get Alzheimer's. I don't have amyloid, but I get the vaccine. And then someday it says, oh, you have amyloid. It goes and gets it and maybe fixes me. And I never get Alzheimer's or it's delayed or it's not, it's not as bad. But 20 years ago, the vaccine, while very successful in removing amyloid, it got rid of it. Um, it inflamed people's brains. It got encephalitis. Some people died. So it was too robust a reaction. So I think the modern vaccines are looking at a way to do that without hurting the brain. And I think there's some success coming in that. That's kind of exciting. And then there's there's a less of a rate of getting Alzheimer's with some of the other vaccines, like the pertussis diphtheria, um, the uh, pneumococcal vaccine, uh, the herpes vaccine. People who get those vaccines get Alzheimer's less. That's intriguing. Mm -hmm. We should all get our vaccines, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so I think uh, in the interest of time, we'll take the your one last question. Uh, it may have been answered in part of this, but it was uh, for that percentage of the population, I'm not sure uh, whether I remember it was 25 or 30% or whatever that uh, had the APO E4 two markers, and so we're too much at risk for that percentage. What, what's the outlook for what other options can we get the line? Yeah, that's a good point. Well, I guess that risk with other treatments will have to be, you know, sorted out. But you, you bring up a good point. Our patients that are not candidates for the new drugs, we're looking at research studies. Um, some of them we reference, including TAL studies and so forth. So, you know, we partnered with a company called CiteRx that sort of monitors studies out there. It uh, helps us a, a bit to uh, match people with the uh, clinical studies, and we're also trying to help them get more studies that they may not have in their database to give people options. Well, thank you guys very much. Uh, it was very informative. We appreciate uh, all your comments and everyone for being here um, and everyone for joining us. Thanks appreciate so much. It. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.